We've been talking about energy policy since Jimmy Carter was president. In that time, we have fought wars in the Persian Gulf, watched the polar ice caps recede, and watched in horror as oil spilled in the Gulf of Mexico. Meanwhile, other countries have moved aggressively to invest in alternative energy sources. How has the United States responded? We thought we had a solution with cap and trade. It seemed like an ingenious plan to reduce emissions and spur the development of new clean energy technologies. But the closer we got to adoption of this historic policy, the political and economic reservations became more pronounced. However well-intentioned, the cap-and-trade regime failed because of three major flaws. 1. It was too complex and too full of loopholes. It was a Rube Goldberg of energy policy. 2. It assumed we had all the clean technologies we needed to replace the fossil fuel sources. Wind, solar, biofuels, and the like are all great, but we really don't have versions of them that can readily be moved into place at a mass scale affordably anytime soon. Third, it would actually hurt U.S. competitiveness. Energy prices will go up. Domestic companies that would be doing the right thing and trying to comply with cap and trade would be competing with overseas firms not impacted by cap and trade. Eventually, that would mean lost market share and no choice but to shift jobs overseas. And is this really the right time to do that? So where do we go from here? Before acting, we need to come to grips with three facts. One, energy innovation represents a huge economic opportunity. Two, other countries seem to grasp energy innovation better than we do. And three, we cannot seize this opportunity by tinkering with a few subsidies for today's alternatives. We need to think bold, but the clock is running. In the report, The Atlantic Century, ITIF concluded that the U.S. dropped from number one to number six among 40 developed countries in competitiveness across a number of categories, such as taxes, education, and productivity. What is worse is that we rank 40th in the pace of change. That means we're falling back on our capacity to keep up. Unless we act creatively and aggressively, we might long for the days when we were number six. And there's no better place to jumpstart American competitiveness and creativity than in the clean energy sector. We can accomplish this with what we call the Innovation Carbon Price. Briefly, the Innovation Carbon Price will be a $15 per ton tax on carbon on all upstream, combustible, non-feedstock energy sources, such as refineries, power plants, and pipelines. It would sunset in 15 years to allow us to reduce the level of the carbon tax in the future based on the success of clean technologies. We estimate that this could raise $90 billion per year. That's a pretty big windfall. We use the right way, we can get on a firmer footing with our energy policy and get back in the number one slot of a competitive, innovative economy. We propose taking 20% or $15 billion of this revenue and investing it in a clean energy innovation trust fund aimed at making clean energy cheap. According to the Energy Innovation Tracker, the United States only invests $4.5 billion annually in clean energy innovation. Many experts say we need something more like 15 to $30 billion in annual investment. The trust fund will provide energy innovation projects like RPE a much needed annual boost without the uncertainty of the congressional budget process. The other 80% of that $90 billion, or about $75 billion, would fund targeted corporate tax incentives aimed at spurring economic growth and help offset the cost of higher energy prices to businesses and consumers, namely through tax breaks for investing in the building blocks of innovation and economic growth, research and development, workforce training, and capital equipment and machinery. Now let's provide a little more detail about the tax incentives. First, the R&D tax credit. The R&D tax credit is the principal way the government incentivizes businesses to invest more in research, yet the credit has steadily declined in generosity over time as other countries offer more generous incentives. As a result, the U.S. has fallen from having the best R&D tax credit to having the 17th most generous credit compared to the rest of the world. This is important because U.S. R&D growth has stagnated for much of the last 15 years. The most widely taken credit, the Alternative Simplified Credit, is set at 14% for R&D investment, made above 50% of the average of the past three years of investments, otherwise called the base. We propose increasing the rate to 50% for R&D investments made above 75% of the base. We estimate that increasing the credit in this manner would provide an additional $8.5 billion in tax credits. Second, the collaborative R&D credit. 
Currently, the U.S. provides a 20% flat tax credit for research consortia of universities, businesses, and government agencies of five or more firms conducting only energy research. The credit was implemented in 2005 as a way to incentivize more public-private partnerships in developing clean technologies. But because of the narrow requirements of the credit, it is rarely taken by industry. So we propose increasing the flat rate to 40% and expanding it to include all collaborative R&D between a business and a university or federal agency, as well as for research consortia. We estimate that this will provide an additional $3 billion in tax incentives. Third, the Workforce Training Tax Credit. We propose creating a knowledge tax credit by making workforce training expenditures eligible for the Alternative Simplified Credit. In the last 10 years, private sector investment in workforce training has declined by 50% as a share of GDP. This results in workers being less productive and at a competitive disadvantage to foreign workers. Corporate workforce training expenditures will be eligible for the 50% ASC providing $12 billion in tax incentives annually. Fourth, the Capital Equipment Investment Tax Credit. Since 1986, the U.S. has depreciated capital expenditures over time, thus increasing the initial after-tax price of capital. More recently, Congress has implemented bonus expensing incentives to allow businesses to gain more tax benefits up front. But these incentives are temporary and limited. Instead, we propose an investment tax credit of 50% for all capital equipment and machinery purchases above 75% of the base. We estimate that this incentive alone would provide $51.5 billion in tax cuts to businesses. Now, on paper, there would be two immediate criticisms of this proposal. First, the dreaded T word. Isn't this just a new tax on corporations in a time of great economic uncertainty? The answer is, not really. Businesses will be getting the money back, with a chance to spend it on the stuff that counts. The tax incentives would offset most, if not all, carbon tax costs on a per-industry basis, reducing the impact the carbon tax would have on industrial competitiveness. In fact, businesses would gain a net benefit of $21 billion in more incentives than carbon tax. Of course, the impact on business would vary from industry to industry. Businesses that invest more in R&D, training, and equipment would receive a more generous tax cut. And even carbon-intensive industries would receive a net benefit or significantly reduce carbon tax costs compared to a policy that included no tax incentives at all. The second criticism is that the proposal is just corporate welfare at the expense of consumers. But that isn't true either. In truth, households would incur a total carbon tax cost of $36 billion, reflected in higher gasoline prices, higher electricity prices, and higher heating costs. But in the short run, businesses would pass much of the net benefits from the tax cuts back to consumers as lower cost goods and services. And after accounting for a small percentage of these business net benefits going to corporate shareholders as dividends, consumers would gain $19 billion in lower cost goods. Therefore, consumers would realize only roughly $17 billion in net costs, most of which is invested in the Clean Energy Innovation Trust Fund. And in the long term, the benefit to consumers dwarf the short-term costs of the carbon tax. We calculated the long-term impacts of the tax incentives on both productivity and economic growth. Over 15 years, the proposal, without accounting for the economic benefits of innovation spurred by the Trust Fund, would grow the economy by almost three-quarters of a trillion dollars. So, the bottom line is this. We know that the last 30 years of debate and a hodgepodge of short-sighted energy policies have not given up the breakthroughs in clean energy innovations we desperately need. We also know our tax policies, education practices, and investments in new R&D and productivity are stagnating, if not declining, and we are slipping behind other countries who are implementing better, aggressive policies. So why not try something new? If there is some consensus that we need to make carbon more expensive in some way, let's do it in a way that gives rise to the energy innovations we need and grows the economy.